William Walker Atkinson's The New Psychology, Its Message, Principles, and the Practice. Chapter 13 was Memory. This is Chapter 14, Desire. Desire is the great motive power of life, the great incentive to action. A man is largely what the quality and degree of his desires have led him to be. Desire is the fire which produces the steam of action. No matter how splendidly a man may be equipped with the other mental faculties, no matter how great may be his powers of perception, reason, judgment, application, or even will. Unless he also possesses a strong desire for accomplishment, the other faculties will never be brought into action. Desire is the great inciter of mental and physical activities, the arouser of the will. As we have said in writing on the subject, desire is at the bottom of all feeling. Before we can love or hate, there must be desire. Before we can have ambition or aspiration, there must be desire. Desire for something must underlie all life action, desire conscious or subconscious. Abstract thought is a cold, bare thing, lacking vitality and warmth. Desire is filled with life, throbbing, longing, wanting, craving, insisting, and ever pressing outward toward action. Desire is, indeed, the phase of mental action that is the motive force. <clears throat> we may call desire by the more popular terms, ambition, aspiration, longing for attainment, etc. But the desire is ever the basic principle of all longing, wishing, and wanting. Not only is our life largely determined by the nature and quality of our desires, but our accomplishments and attainments depend very materially upon the degree of our desire. The quality of desire determines in what mental path we shall travel, but the degree determines how far we shall travel. The majority of people manifest but little desire. They may want things, it is true, but they do not want them hard enough. Their desires end in mere wishing and wanting. They do not reach the stage of action. Desire unexpressed <clears throat> excuse me, is like steam in a boiler that has not reached the intensity required to drive the engine. Increase the intensity and the degree, and the steam rushes out, and in a moment the pistons are moving and the wheels revolving. The great men in all walks of life have possessed Strong desires for attainment, accomplishment, and possession. The principle being the same in all these cases. Their desire was of such a degree that it reached the explosive point and manifested in action. It is generally taught that will is the great motive power that imparts the energy to the action. The will is more as a guiding, directing force which applies the energy of the desire. Will is cold and steely, desire is glowing with heat and fire. The will may, and does, guide, direct, restrict, hold back, and even destroy the desire in some cases. Nevertheless, desire supplies the energy for action. No matter how strong a will the individual may have, unless he has strong desire to use the will, he does not use it. No matter how clearly a man may see how a thing may be done, no matter how well his reason and judgment may point out the way, no matter how clear an imagination he may possess to picture the plan of the action, unless he be possessed of the desire to act, and that in a goodly degree, then there would be no action. And yet, it must be admitted that the will is the highest instrument of the ego, for it or by it, the individual is enabled to create desires within himself, or else change existing desires, or else kill existing desires in his subconscious mentality. All this is possible, but still 
before he can do any of these things, he must first de desire to do them, so that even in the final analysis, desire is seen to supply the motive force and to, to be the incentive to action. The individual who allows desire to master him is to be pitted. And yet, this is true of the great majority of the race who are swayed in this way and that way by their desires, and who have not acquired the art of submitting their desires to the judgment of their reason and the control of their will. The man who has acquired the art of controlling and directing his desires has traveled far on the road to attainment. For to such a man, desire becomes a faithful and efficient servant, inspiring action and interest, and therefore, all the other mental faculties. It seems strange at first thought to think of the ego deliberately using the judgment and will to incite desire in the subconscious mind in order to inspire the mind to action and attainment. But when it is remembered that this is merely another instance of the ego using its tools and instruments in its own workshop in order to turn out the finished product of action, the matter seems plainer. The ego without the mental workshop would be simply the pure ego, devoid of its machinery of expression and of manifestation. As some of the Hindu philosophers have expressed it, the ego would be like a man who could see but who had no legs, and who could not move by himself. This legless man, the ego here, meets another man, the mental faculties, who is blind, but who possesses a good pair of legs. The legless man mounts on the shoulders of the blind man, and the two start off on their travels, the upper man directing and controlling the man with the legs. If the man with the legs were allowed to run away or to refuse obedience, the pair would come to grief. And yet, without him, the pair could not progress. Each performs his part, and each needs each other. But the man who can see must always be the master and the director. The ego must always control and master the mental faculties, else they would rob it of its power. To the average person who thinks at all about it, the matter of the origin of desires is veiled in mystery. He knows that he does not evolve them from his reason, for they seem to spring into consciousness from nowhere. And yet the psychologist knows that all mental states have their preceding causes and reason. There is but one answer to the riddle. All desires emerge from the subconscious region, either in the sense of being a reproduction of some emotion or feeling previously experienced and brought into the field of consciousness as a memory, or else in the sense of being a response of the stored up impressions brought into new activity in response to the appearance from some outside thing which awakens the latent forces. In either case, desire emerges from the subconsciousness and is distinctly a phenomenon of that region of the mind. And accordingly, the methods for cultivating or restricting the subconscious mental states are applicable in the case of desires. Desire is connected on one side with the feeling and emotional phase of mentation, and on the other, with the phase of volition or will. On its inner side, desire is but the product of various states and combinations of states of feeling and emotion. On this side, it is connected with the mental life of the past, either racial or individual. On its outer side, it is connected with volition or will, and relates to the present or the future. A desire must always have as its basis some antecedent feeling or emotion, and at the same time some antecedent experience, either racial or individual. One never desires a thing unless he has some, 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 excuse me, some subconscious experience of feeling. And moreover, this experience presupposes some antecedent knowledge of the thing desired. One never desires a thing unless there is registered in, this, in his subconsciousness a trace of knowledge of the thing itself. Show a person an object of which he has no registration of previous experience, racial or individual, and he feels no desire or repulsion for the thing, for he knows nothing of its qualities. 
let him undergo an experience regarding it. And ever after, he will have a definite feeling for or against it, subject, of course, to revision on account of further knowledge. In this connection, it must be remembered that repulsion, aversion, dislike, or fear are but negative forms of desire, are in fact desires not to experience the thing. And consequently, the same laws and rules are applicable to aversion, repulsion, or fear, as well as to the phases of positive desire. It naturally follows that if the ego exerts a control over its subconscious region of mentality, it may develop or restrain the desires emerging therefrom by holding the attention on one set of ideas or objects in the imagination by means of the will one may grow the desires he thinks conducive to his well-being and likewise may restrain or inhibit those calculated to work against his well-being desires grow by the amount of attention and interest bestowed upon them and wither and decay in proportion that the attention and interest are withheld from them. In order to cultivate a set of desires, one should resolutely determine to devote to them much attention and interest. That is, he should think of objects calculated to encourage and nourish those particular desires, make frequent mental images of them in the imagination, devote much interest and thought to all connected with them. In short, keep the objects calculated to bring forth the desire in mind as much as possible. In the same way, desires, which one thinks well to restrain, destroy, or inhibit, should be treated in two ways. One, by resolutely keeping the attention and interest away from them, for by so doing you shut off the nourishment from them, and they wither and die by reason thereof. And two, by keeping well in mind the thoughts and feelings calculated to, to grow, nourish, and foster the desires of the opposite direction of the dying desires. And by the direct opposite. By so doing, you let in the sunshine that drives out the darkness. This is the antidote to the bane of unworthy desires. Kill them out by encouraging their opposites. The new psychology holds that the ego has full power to regulate its own desires, to encourage or restrain them as it will. By the power of attention and interest under the control of the reason and the will. This plan requires perseverance but so does everything else worth having. Let your ego be the master and insist that desire be the servant and not the ruler of yourself. Chapter 15 will be the will.